The exploration of Venus has been mainly about getting down to the surface of the planet. The Soviet Union sacrificed lander after lander to discover just how extreme the conditions are down there on the ground. But higher up, among the clouds, the climate on Venus is surprisingly Earth-like in temperature and pressure. And there have been some fascinating ideas for robotic and human explorers to fly the skies of Venus to help understand our evil twin planet. Let's take a look at them. I've mentioned in several videos just how bad the surface of Venus is. The average temperature is 471 Celsius or 880 degrees Fahrenheit, hot enough to melt cadmium. The surface pressure of its mostly carbon dioxide atmosphere is 92 bars, 92 times greater than what you'd experience on Earth, which is the equivalent of being a kilometer beneath the ocean. And to make matters worse, it rains sulfuric acid. Seriously, that's just insult after injury. But as you gain altitude, things get a little better. At 60 kilometers altitude, the thick yellowish cloud layer begins, signaling the boundary to Venus's lower and middle atmosphere. It's this layer that obscures our view of the surface of the planet until the cloud penetrating radar of NASA's Magellan spacecraft arrived on the scene to peer through them. The upper levels of this band of clouds contain droplets of sulfuric acid, but the lower regions are still a mystery. Is there lightning on Venus? Scientists are unsure. Visual astronomers have reported flashes coming from Venus for decades. The Soviet Venera spacecraft detected radio emissions believed to come from lightning as they descended through the cloud tops on their way to the surface. But many other spacecraft have searched Venus for lightning and found nothing. Billions of years ago, Venus was wetter than it is today, and its atmosphere is constantly blowing off into space. When did this transition happen? Is it still going on? By measuring the atmosphere at different altitudes, scientists can better understand the history of water on Venus. And one fascinating question is whether or not there could be life on Venus. Not down on the surface, obviously, but at higher altitudes, microbial life could be permanently held aloft in high winds. The exploration of Venus by air has only happened one time with the Soviet Vega missions in 1985. Twin balloons were deployed into the Venusian atmosphere at an altitude of 54 kilometers, and they floated around. For 46 hours, they survived till their batteries ran out of power. But this one glimpse at one altitude isn't enough. Scientists want more. They want to sample the atmosphere at different layers for longer periods to understand the winds, chemical composition of the atmosphere, and track its interaction with the surface. And that means flying in the unfriendly skies of Venus for months or even years. In 2018, NASA published a study called the Aerial Platforms for the Scientific Exploration of Venus. It was the result of several workshops and teleconferences by a team of 52 experts who proposed various ways to explore the atmosphere of Venus using fairly mature technologies. Their focus was on vehicles that would operate in Venus's temperate zone between altitudes of 50 and 65 kilometers with temperatures below 77 Celsius, which could also make brief dives down to the cloud base at 47 kilometers, where temperatures can rise to 100 Celsius, the boiling point of water. They also considered sounding probes that could be lowered down to the surface and then relayed back to Earth from the aerial mission. The first class of missions considered were fixed altitude balloons, which would arrive at Venus and sink to the preferred altitude. These kinds of balloons are used here on Earth for long duration missions to study the atmosphere, and it's the kind of balloons that were used in the Soviet Vega program. The Soviet balloons were 3.5 meters in diameter and carried a 7 kilogram payload. Over the course of their 46 hour lifespan, they traveled over 11,000 kilometers. Clearly, this is an effective way to make a lot of distance on Venus. A future fixed altitude balloon mission might measure seven and a half meters across and be capable of carrying a 110 kilogram payload. And prototype balloons capable of surviving the environment in Venus at an altitude of 54 kilometers have already been developed by NASA. In 2007, NASA tested a balloon concept inspired by the airbag system that helped NASA's Spirit and Opportunity land on Mars. 
Twin balloons would be flown to Venus at the same time, one for the tropics and one for the poles. The balloons would be packed up tightly inside their aeroshell, as well as high pressure helium tanks and valves. Once the spacecraft had slowed down enough, they would inflate their balloon, throw the heavier tanks overboard, and then float around in the atmosphere of Venus. The next concept is variable altitude balloons, which would have the ability to raise and lower their altitude depending on the atmospheric level that they're studying. They could use an onboard compressor to change their buoyancy, like a submarine changes depth in the ocean. And with this capability, the missions could range in altitude between 50 and 60 kilometers, seeking wind currents and moving in different directions. They considered two ideas for managing their buoyancy. One would be a helium balloon that has a second balloon containing a reversible fluid that changes phase at different altitudes. This chemical would be a gas at lower warmer altitudes and then change to a liquid as it gets higher and cooler, kind of like a lava lamp. It would constantly raise and lower its altitude. This technology would work best below altitudes of 55 kilometers. The other concept would be a balloon with two chambers, one that's a specific size and another which can flex. A helium pump running on solar power would shift the gas back and forth between the chambers, allowing it to control its altitude. And this technology works best at altitudes above 55 kilometers. We talked about fixed and variable balloons. Next, we'll talk about airplanes and airships to explore the cloud tops of Venus. And I'll get to that in a second. But first, I'd like to thank Matthew Peterson, Jesse, Pavel Kalinko, Thomas Schiller, and the rest of our 839 patrons for their generous support. Of course, I'd love for you to join my Patreon, but if there are creators making things you love, support them directly. You have no idea how meaningful an impact you can make and help ensure that the creators making the content you love can focus on their work. Join our community at patreon.com slash universe today and you'll see our videos early as well as bloopers, behind the scenes videos, and I'll remove all the ads from Universe Today. The third technology considered by the panel was airplanes. These would be solar powered using electricity to drive a propeller that keeps them constantly moving. To remain in the sunlight, however, they need to follow currents that keep them moving faster than 100 meters per second or 360 kilometers per hour. This limits the parts of Venus that they can explore. They also need to stay up high in the atmosphere where they can get the most sunlight falling on their panels. NASA recently awarded a contract to Black Swift Technologies to develop a robotic aircraft that would fly around the upper atmosphere of Venus. Their concept aircraft would use dynamic soaring, the same kind of wing shape as birds like the albatross, which can remain aloft for over a year. One idea that really caught my eye is called the Bio-Inspired Ray for Extreme Environments and zonal explorations, or breeze. This concept was proposed by the University of Buffalo and takes its inspiration from real life stingrays. The aircraft would completely circumnavigate Venus every four to six days using solar panels to keep itself recharged while it's in the day side of Venus. A tensioning system inside its wings would allow them to flap up and down, helping it maneuver as well as generate thrust and lift. The aircraft could dive down deeper into the atmosphere where it's hotter and more dangerous and then flap its wings to get up to a safer altitude and cool off. Finally, the team looked at airships, which use both buoyancy and aerodynamic lift to remain aloft and control altitude. This technology would have the added advantage that the airship could have the right shape for atmospheric entry, so it wouldn't just need a separate aeroshell. It could just fly to Venus, enter the atmosphere, and get to work. During the Venusian day, it would use solar power to raise its altitude to 60 kilometers and then sink back down to 50 kilometers at night. Northrop Grumman has proposed their Venus Atmospheric Maneuverable Platform, or VAMP. This looks like a flying wing aircraft with a 50 meter wingspan. It would be carried to Venus on another spacecraft and then be released from orbit and enter the atmosphere directly without an airshell. The aircraft would then be able to fly at many different altitudes. At its highest point, its hydrogen gas would only provide 10% of its lift, the rest coming from its solar powered propellers that would allow it to cruise at 110 kilometers per hour. But it could also sink down to an altitude of 55 kilometers, where it would become 100% buoyant, waiting through the Venusian night for the sunlight to return. 
One of the coolest ideas to explore Venus has got to be NASA's high altitude Venus operational concept or havoc. These would start with robotic 30 meter airships, which would fly at an altitude of 50 kilometers at Venus collecting science information. If this proves safe and successful, NASA has even considered sending astronauts in larger 129 meter long airships, which would cruise around the cloud tops for up to a year. That could lead to a permanently inhabited science station, a constantly growing cloud city on Venus with ascent rockets that could bring astronauts back to Earth. In addition to the actual balloons, airplanes and blimps, the panel looked at the probes that could be lowered down. They calculated that a one kilogram science payload could be lowered right down to the surface, recording data and taking pictures. And for brief periods, a vehicle with enough heat tolerance could go down into the harsher environment and then ascend again to cool off. I'm incredibly excited about the potential for the future exploration of Venus. Seriously, we need to go back and learn more about our evil twin planet. What do you think? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Here are the names of the patrons who support us at the $10 level and more. Want to see your name here and support the work we do? Go to patreon.com slash universe today. Once a week, I gather up all my space news into a single email newsletter and send it out. It's got pictures, brief highlights about the story, and links you can find out more. Go to universetoday.com slash newsletter to sign up. And did you know that all of my videos are also available in a handy audio podcast format? So you can have the latest episodes as well as special bonus material like interviews with me show up right on your audio device. Go to universetoday.com slash audio or search for Universe Today on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And I'll put a link in the show notes. It's not only the cloud tops of Venus that scientists want to study. NASA and Russia have plans to visit the surface of Venus with all kinds of heat tolerant landers, rovers, and even a land sailor. We did a whole video on those ideas, which you can watch here.